called The Devil in Milk. If you want to read this book in detail, you can read it here. It was published about seven or eight years ago uh, by the professor of dairy science in New Zealand University. This story will be the largest business story in Wisconsin in the next 10 years because our dairy industry is going to be turned upside down. Every dairy farmer should pay attention to this. This is the biggest story because it has huge impacts. Okay, now I make that claim. Let's see if I can convince you that that's right. So I'm going to tell you what are the components of milk. I'm going to tell you what BCM7 is. That's the devil. And we're going to talk about that and what that does. And then we're going to talk about associations of disease and a couple mechanisms of damage and going through what gluten does. And then there's politics. And hopefully if we can do that in about 45 minutes, you'll understand it all and then we can take questions. So we're beginning to recognize that there's something in milk and that milk has two families, A1 milk and A2 milk. Has anybody heard this topic before? No. Okay, my job is to make you understand this completely. And so we're going to go through and tell you that. So first of all, the components of milk. We all know that milk has carbs in it, those sugar called lactose. And lactose is a two sugars put together, one glucose and one galactose. And then fat, up to 14 to 15 percent fat, which is why in, I think in Wisconsin we make custard is particularly delicious because it's up there in the 14 percent range, uh, depending on what breed. And then there's proteins. And the proteins are whey, and whey is what comes out. It doesn't precipitate out of cheese, so that's what's left over when you have to make cheese. And then there's casein, and that's what does precipitate out. And casein, and there's about seven different kinds of caseins. And there's a couple of good bacteria in there, and then there's a bunch of, of what are called oligosaccharides, and those are some healthy uh, sugars. And then there's antibodies. And antibodies are probably species-specific, so when you breastfeed, it helps a human to get cow antibodies or human antibodies. So you can see one cup of milk breaks down to this kind of stuff. There's like 10 to 12 grams of lactose and 5 to 7 grams of fat and some, a couple minerals. There's calcium and magnesium. And then there's these proteins. So you have about 38 grams of solids in milk. So milk has a fair amount of solids in it. Now, we could probably talk for an hour about the problems of lactose and galactose, but that's not what this talks about. We're talking about beta casein tonight. But what, the reason I want to mention that is galactose, there was a st there's been to and fro conversation in the medical literature for quite a while about is milk acidic and do you, why do people who drink more milk break more bones? And that's been going back and forth for about 15 years. And every now and then some professor of nutrition publishes a review article and says, oh no, it's not dangerous for you. But then last year, a fairly large study following some a couple hundred thousand Swedish women looked at what happened to them when they drank more and more amounts of milk. And fresh milk is something new in the human food chain because that's you can only have fresh milk if you have refrigeration. Otherwise, you're going to make yogurt or cheese because if, you have, if you're living in a hot climate, if you were a farmer 100 years ago today and you didn't have refrigeration, you would be uh, making yogurt pretty quickly, whether you liked it or not or making butter, or making cheese, trying to get it processed. Uh, but it turns out that you uh, have a very strong association the more milk you drink, up to, up to the fact, and what they now can measure, uh, there's something called 8-ISO-PFG-2A, which is basically a prostaglandin, an inflammatory prostaglandin, that shows you've got inflammation. And what we do know is that galactose is the problem. And when you ferment milk, the bacteria you ferment with digest the galactose. Oh, so when you make yogurt and cheese, the galactose gets digested. But galactose turns out to be a bit of a problem for humans. And the more you drink, the more inflammation you make, and you get about five grams of galactose per glass of milk. So that's a separate problem from what we're talking about tonight. So, and you know, in, in laboratory animals and fruit flies, you can uh, accelerate their you can accelerate their lifespan. You can make them die faster and age prematurely by drinking more galactose. You put galactose in their food and they'll die faster and accelerate. In rat models, you can show that they age faster with lots of oxidative stress, which is all these prostaglandins. So that's galactose. 
We're not going to go into more detail on that, but I find that interesting, suggesting you shouldn't drink a lot of milk. Now, there's clear evolutionary advantage. Humans got bigger and stronger when we domesticated cows. So there's a clear evolutionary advantage to some degree to having the extra protein and fat from milk. So we've benefited from that hugely. But I'm going to talk about the details, and I'm going to see if I can convince you about the details, even with all that. Uh, and so here's that article from, that was published in the British Journal of Nutrition about higher mortality. We're going to talk about beta casein tonight. Beta casein is the protein that comes out in cheese. And beta casein is the dominant protein. Whey is the other. Uh, it's 209 amino acids long, and it's pretty balanced amino acids needed for baby cows. You know, it's a pretty good, you know, the beta casein of cows is pretty good for cows. Uh, and also, every now, you know, you have to put in a joke somewhere. So here, <laughs> the more you think the things that we we're to the same, take this milk, why do we drink cow milk? Who is the guy who first looked at a cow and said, I think I'll drink whatever comes uh, out of these things when I squeeze them? Isn't that weird? Which I think conversation be kept to a minimum after, until afternoon. Uh, you know, and I was just taught by my niece. I'm thinking, I wish I put in here the picture of me milking a goat about two weeks ago. And that was, okay, well, that'll, next time I do this talk. Well, here's what happened. Here's the big picture that I'm going to start explaining to you. 10,000 years ago, the estimate goes, in a great, 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 great grandmother or grandfather of all black cows, Wisconsin cows are black cows, Holsteins. They're black and white, but we'll call them black. Okay? There was a single gene mutation, a single gene of one amino acid, just one amino acid changed. And as a consequence, the offspring of that black cow all carry that gene. And that one amino acid is in most of North America's cows and most of Europe. Most of Europe has black cows. If you go to England and Germany and Denmark and Sweden and Poland and Austria, everywhere except for France, in Switzerland. And I know this to be true. My son lives in Geneva, Switzerland. And when I go driving around, I've been paying attention. Sure enough, all their herds in Switzerland are brown cows. But brown cows are also the dominant cow in all of Asia and in all of Africa. So Asia and Africa have brown cows. And so, th but these are black cows. And up till about 10 years ago, Australia and New Zealand. But Australia and New Zealand you're going to find out are an extraordinary exception to this. And we're going to tell you about that. So brown cows are India, Asia, Africa, China, and France and Switzerland. Okay? And here's the difference. A1 versus A2 milk. Now A1 was the first one that was characterized, so it was called A1. And that's what's in black cows. So in black cows, you have the following sequence of amino acids. So you get the net effect is you get this switch of proline for histidine in these three in this this segment and interestingly enough these three prolines every other as, every other amino acid make that a very we don't have any enzymes that can digest that little fragment there's this little fragment that includes these three little proteins and we can't digest it so the right protein can't be broken down right there. And so the net effect is it isn't digested, and we're left with that. That's the devil. Okay. So when we drink milk from black cows, we can't digest and break that down, and that gets absorbed to us in a whole piece. All right? Now, just to back up a little bit, here's America's cows, where America's cows live. So when you say upstate New York has a lot of dairy farms, they do, as does Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Michigan has a fair amount, but Mich Wisconsin seems to be well represented, as does Minnesota. What surprised me is New Mexico has a few. Isn't that interesting? And California has a ton, and southern Idaho has a big bunch. So that's where America's dairy cows come from. 
All right? Okay, so here's black cows and their close relatives, Ayrshires and Holsteins, and brown cows. Now this looks all like Indian cows, doesn't it? It looks like African and Indian. Okay, so that is a brown cow. That's a Guernsey, right? And so that cow, I hope it's right. So if you're putting this on the net, I better be right. So I'll other, otherwise I'll hear about it. Okay, uh, but that's a brown cow. And so in Africa, people who drink milk have brown cows. So they don't have A1 milk, they have A2 milk. That amino acid mutation didn't go through to their cows. One more time, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I just want to show you again and again so you learn this. And if you look at beta casein by breed, here's a whole bunch of studies. If you look at Guernsey's, they're just about 99% A2. If you look at Holsteins, they're actually about 50-50. So it's not every Holstein, but they're 50-50. And you only need one out of 100 to contaminate the milk. So you only need a tiny percentage to get the, the devil in there. So all of these breeds actually have some A1 and some A2 in them. Okay, That's really important to understand, because that means in Wisconsin, you can find a bull that's pure A2, A2 by genetics. So you can get bull semen that's pure A2, A2, which means if you use that as your genetic source, then your calves will all be, have at least one A2 gene. And then if you test those calves, you can then sort it out. When you breed that calf, you can maybe every other cow will be A2, A2. It is possible to change a herd over from A1 to A2 because there are some cows in every herd that are some A1 and A2 cows. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Haven't lost anybody yet in all the genetics? Okay, hang in there. So one more time, here is what the devil looks like. It's that seven amino acid fragment and because of the alternating prolines it can't be digested. It's just not breakable. Well, here's the pro what's the problem with that? Well, I may not be doing this in the right sequence, but I'll go through the problem. The problem is the countries that drink A1 milk have much more insulin-dependent diabetes, autism, coronary disease, and schizophrenia, as in much more. As in, but the problem is, is that's epidemiology, not proof. Associations aren't proof. You know, it's just associations. It's interesting. You know, it's, you can make all sorts... The, pro the other problem is that it takes a very long time for the illness, quote, to occur. So there's a very long latency and it's showing up. So for research to happen, you have to have research for decades. But I'm going to show you the data. But uh, the clinical evidence that with autism, BCM is abundant. And for example, in autistic kids, you can show that they are peeing out lots of BCM7 in their urine. It's easily testable and you can find it. And when you take them off milk, they stop peeing it out. And when they stop peeing it out, they get dramatically better. There are seven separate web forums on the web for families with autistic children who are, who are putting their anecdotes and their stories in. Now, as best we can tell by so far by epidemiology that's hard to point out except that there's just thousands of parents who say it works for my kids. And every doctor who treats autistic children says the first thing you have to do is take your kid off milk. And the second thing you have to do is take them off wheat. So we're going to talk about wheat in about five minutes or 20 minutes. So, and then if you take, so here's how it began. Here, here's how the story began. About 20 years ago in New Zealand, somebody noticed that children from Samoa who moved to New Zealand suddenly started getting insulin-dependent diabetes at 10 times the rate. 10 times the rate. Now, insulin-dependent diabetes is an autoimmune disease where your body attacks the islet cells in your pancreas gland and kills them. And does anybody here have a child with insulin-dependent diabetes? Everybody here knows one. You all know somebody who has insulin dependent diabetes. Well, in Samoa, they didn't get it. So same children living in Samoa didn't get it. 
So the folks in New Zealand said, what is going on? You know, there's something interesting here. And somebody said, nobody's quite sure, we can't remember quite who it was. You know, they have brown cows in Samoa and they have black cows here. Maybe it's the milk. And they started looking at that, thinking, okay, let's look at that. Well, when they look at it, they found this incredibly high correlation. If you look at nations and measure how much A1 milk they drink by nation and measure the amount of insulin-dependent diabetes by nation, you get a, I'm going to show you the graph in a couple minutes, but you get a great correlation. And you do the same thing with coronary artery disease, and you get another great correlation. And then autism and schizophrenia, well, so a company in New Zealand applied for patents along that idea, and the author of the book, who is the professor of dairy science at New Ze one of New Zealand's more prominent universities, watched all this process, and he said, they applied for the patent proving that mental health was, that was part of the problem, and that's why they should have the patent, because they had such a strong association. But then that company turned into the company that, that represented all of New Zealand dairy farmers. And so they withdrew the patent and pretended they'd never put it out there and denied having ever applied for it. Well, he had a copy of it, and he kept writing, asking people, what happened to that proof that you had and what were you applying for? Oh, no, we're not going to pay attention to that. We're letting it go. We're not, you know, don't, don't worry about it. That's not a big deal. Because the dominant industry of New Zealand is exporting milk. New Zealand is the biggest dairy export country in the world. But it doesn't export more than Wisconsin to other states. We have a as big or bigger dairy industry in Wisconsin. Okay. And so it got quite political. And in fact, there was a little tiny company that got started called A2 Milk. <laughs> and because of because of the politics of the of the internal politics inside of New Zealand, that company basically was bankrupted with legal issues and they couldn't quite get off the round. Their CEO dropped dead suddenly on eating a potato chip in a hotel room. He choked to death. And so that got weird. Okay, what kind of milk is these cows? Is this what Wisconsin looks like? Right, this is Wisconsin. So here's the proof. Diabetes by country in A1 milk. Now that may look a little bit of a scattergram to you, but to statisticians, that is the strongest correlation of anything predicting diabetes. And the chance of that being by chance is roughly one in a thousand. Mm. The statistical chance is left roughly one in a thousand of that being by chance. Okay, another way of looking at that. So you say, well, okay, that's pretty powerful. Uh, and then they did a there were sort of battles going on in the, in the medical literature over the last 15 years outside of America. This hasn't happened here. Where a study of 15 high-risk individuals were given A1 versus A2 milk in a double-blind crossover study for 24 weeks. And they said there's no correlation. And what's the problem with that study? 24 weeks? That's laughably short. That's just laughably short. You need 48 years to develop heart disease and probably leaky gut at some critical juncture. You probably have to have gut that's damaged that allows your immune system to get fired up. But we won't, we won't do it now. And so then there was a study done in rabbits, and yes, in rabbits, rabbits uh, get heart disease much faster than humans. And sure enough, rabbits fed A2 milk versus A1 milk developed a whole lot more vascular disease. So they did. The problem is they're rabbits. You know, it's not humans. There's the line for heart disease. There's a stronger line here for heart disease in A1 milk than there is for cholesterol. That's an interesting issue. Half of us are dying from heart disease in America. What's going on here? OK. What kind of milk is this? It's camel milk. And is it A1 or A2? It's A2. Yeah. Every other thing is just black cows. Every other animal has. So there's A2 milk. So. There's heart disease again, more of it. So, so then there was a, a mouse study that was going to solve everything. And the mouse study was going to be done by four different labs, and it was going to duplicate the whole shebang. And they were all four different people, all going to do it differently. The problem is, 
whether it was intentional sabotage or carelessness or stupidity, but all the mouse food was contaminated with baby formula, with progestamil, made from A1 milk. And now that study, the book, the book, The Devil and Milk, goes into about oh, a whole chapter and a half on it, how the people who conducted that study continued to deny that that was a problem even after they'd been publicly notified that they had contaminating stuff, which meant that this study didn't solve the problem. But yet, nevertheless, everybody who's been a adversary for the concept keeps quoting this study as being proof that that's not true. And so, and Fonterra was the New Zealand dairy export company. So seven of the authors knew the contamination, didn't mention or acknowledge it, and it's now, it's now widely quoted as proof. So when you go back and try to look at these studies and you follow the thread, you need to have an expert who guides you through it and shows you what's going on. And what I think is going on is the, the dark hand of financial interests behind the scenes manipulating the data. So just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, and so meantime, inside Fonterra, which is New Zealand's dairy export business, there are documents that show there's concern about the research data, and that would have damaged New Zealand's major export, and they were afraid that if they in any way acknowledged it, you could have plaintiff's attorney come along and say, we need a class action lawsuit because anybody who gets autism in this country, the dairy farmers are going to have to pay for it. So they got completely spooked and backed off and said, you know, so they just maintained an absolutely neutral face and said, we're just not even acknowledging that it exists. So meantime, this little company, A2 Milk, is going bankrupt and they're very happy to get rid of them and get it, you know, get it out of the way. So more evidence shows up, though. Uh, okay, so here's the, I'm sorry, here's the very high correlation. I'm, I'm talking about the correlation. So 0.7 can also be read less than one in a thousand chance of being random. So an R value of 0.7. So conclusion, some common event causes them both. And that that's more important than cholesterol, fish oil, vegetables, wine, all those things you do to prevent heart disease, A2 milk is more important. A1 milk and A2 milk is more important. Okay, pop quiz again. What kind of cows are these? A2. These are A2 brown cows. All right. And then there's something that's called casomorphine. Now, this is where I get totally fascinated, so hang, see if I can explain this to you. How many here have heard about uh, LDN, low-dose naltrexone? Okay. Low-dose naltrexone, do you know what naltrexone is? I'm an emergency doctor, and if you take a heroin overdose, and you're lying there, one of the things of a heroin overdose is you're breathing three times a minute. And the paramedics come to your house, and they'll give you naltrexone under your tongue, because after you've started an IV, and you'll wake up. Though actually what the paramedics really do is they breathe for you and they bring you to the ER because when you wake up you're going to be really pissed off because you're a heroin addict and they just took away your high. So you wake up mad. So I save your life but you're mad. Okay. So that was my experience as an emergency doctor. The paramedics wouldn't give it to them. In the, they would bring them into the ER unless us give it to them. Okay. Well it turns out that naltrexone blocks the morphine receptor that heroin is giving you an overdose for. Low-dose naltrexone, that's a 50 milligram dose. Low-dose naltrexone is when you give somebody four and a half milligrams, a tiny amount at bedtime. And you take it at bedtime, you actually build up over a couple months, and there's a fair number of autoimmune diseases that have a spooky tendency to get better. Now the morphine receptor is not built into us human beings so that we can have fun being heroin addicts. It's there because it's part of our immune system. But when you block it, your body goes, what's going on? And you sort of change the balance of your immune functions. And that changing balance puts many autoimmune diseases into neutral. Mm -hmm. And so you can read a book called Up a Creek with a Paddle. That's a book about a person who had multiple sclerosis to the point of not being able to walk getting their walking back by taking low-dose naltrexone. So that's what naltrexone is. Guess where BCM7 fits? Right in the naltrexone receptor, which is exactly where gluten fits. Okay, 
So they're going to have a effect on your immune system and change some of the balance of your immune function. So when you take mice that are going to get diabetes and you give them A2 milk or A1 milk, 70% of them should get diabetes. But if you give them naltrexone and block that receptor, they don't get the diabetes. So blocking that morphine receptor blocks the tendency to become diabetic. So it blocks the devil effect of the devil in milk because it's blocking the morphine receptor. Now what's interesting is that morphine effect, anybody here get constipated when you eat cheese? Careful, you're on the internet, so you know. <laughs> Everybody knows that. You eat a lot of cheese and your bowels slow down. Is that an effect because cheese has a lot of this in it? Or were black cows nicer cows because they had A2 milk in them and that gave them a little bit of morphine effect so they got to be a little more mellow? Have you ever tried to lead a 1800 pound Holstein around a stall? You know, if you're just a little kid, it's nice to have a mellow cow. So maybe it was useful to have cows that were kind of placid and calm and they made their own, who knows what that, you might make different conjectures about what that effect had. But there seems to be a morphine effect. It's certainly known to be a morphine effect, both by the chemical effect of autoimmune diseases and the calming and addicting effect on children. Now, how many people say they feel slightly addicted to cheese? You eat cheese, you love it so much, you stop eating it, you really miss it. You junkie you. You BCM junkie you. Okay? Isn't that interesting? So in the meantime, if we think about that and take it, you can say, well, here's naltrexone. It's well known for reversing morphine. It's also widely used for control of autoimmune diseases. Low-dose naltrexone has lots of published literature about the effect on Crohn's disease. And it raises the conjecture, is BCM7 in the same camp as low-dose naltrexone? One is occupying it and causing a positive effect. The other is occupying the same receptor and causing a negative effect. But they prove each other by the fact that they both seem to be working on the same receptor, which means, yeah, that receptor really matters to your immune function. Now, do you know what percentage of American women are getting an autoimmune disease currently? 40%. 40% of American women, which would mean about this half the room over, which side do you want? Should it be this half or that half? <laughs> right. Whichever half. Uh, so what, okay, here's a goat. This is what I'm going to have to put in my picture. So then there is autism. Autistic kids excrete a lot of BCM7. Isn't that interesting? And when taken off of wheat and milk, they stop excreting it. And many, many parents will tell you they're much better. Even though a couple of published studies that have been short term have denounced it. If you Google it and look up those studies, there is so many anecdotal reports and so many websites saying how much better they do. And every doctor I know who treats autistic kids says that's the first step they do. And so there's all these web discussion forums on it and many thousands of parents following it. And yet the two studies have not gone long enough and something about randomizing it loses that effect. So I think there's still research to be done and work to be done on it to sort that out. But there's a funny overlap between wheat allergy and casein allergy. And so right now there's all this discussion, are you wheat allergic or are you milk allergic or do you need to get off both of them? And many of you have heard discussion amongst your friends and colleagues about one thing or the other. But many of those can be blocked by naloxone. And so I'm not sure where to go with So, okay, here's sheep milk. Sheep milk is? A, A2 milk, okay. And the protein gluten versus A1 milk, A1 protein digests in a similar way to gluten, both cause inflammation in the gut and all the uncomfortable side effects. In fact, A1 protein is 10 times more potent than gluten, meaning the smallest amount can have a big effect. So it only takes one cow out of 100 to contaminate milk. And every dairy herd has two or 300 cows. And so unless that herd is completely pure, you're going to have some A2 contamination come through. And then the schizophrenia. Do you know that New, Z New Guinea had absolutely no schizophrenia whatsoever until World War II when um, the Americans show up and we're fighting the Japanese and we bring a lot of wheat and milk over. And we start feeding the people who live there and suddenly they start having schizophrenia. 
the psychiatrist who discovered that actually went back and he, he was the head doctor at a VA in Philadelphia and he secretly took, put everybody on his ward, he put, took them off of wheat and 40% of them were discharged over the course of the next month. Uh, but we know that there's a strong association between gluten and schizophrenia and A2 milk, and, or A1 milk and schizophrenia. There's the same gradient with A1 milk that's not seen with A2 milk. And it's interesting, there's other things like schizophrenics, for example, have five times the rate of insulin-dependent diabetes as the rest of the population. Now again, that's another association. It sure is interesting, but if you look at folks like people who have ulcer disease, now if you have ulcer disease, that means you have a damaged gut, and you start taking something for your acid disease. There was a famous study where they took folks and put them on the milk diet for acid disease. Anybody ever hear about the milk for, milk for acid? Ever drink milk for acid trouble? There was a famous study in which they applied, gave milk to a bunch of folks who were, had some kind of ulcer trouble. That was before we knew it was an infectious disease caused by H. pylori. And we gave folks a whole bunch of milk to fix it. And guess what happened to the incidence of coronary artery disease? It shot through the roof, so they stopped the study. So if you have leaky gut and I give you a whole bunch of A2 milk, you're going to get coronary artery disease. I mean A1 milk, sorry, thank you. Otherwise I'll get complaints from the internet, so, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so here's just an example. Here's what the lining of your gut looks like when you have normal gut. Here's what the lining of, looks like with celiac disease. So there's, there's really seven pieces of evidence, and I just want, in the book, The Devil and Milk, he outlines seven pieces of evidence at the end of his book, and I just want to give you that the nugget of what he's calling is his evidence. First one, the epidemiology of insulin dependent and heart disease is the strongest association there is. There is no stronger association for those two illnesses. Now, that's not proof, but it sure is interesting, all right? Digestion is different. With even one amino acid different, A1 protein is digested completely differently because those three prolines make an indigestible sequence. And there's clear evidence that that seven amino acid sequence is absorbed and has pharmacological activity. And three different labs have shown that BCM7 is released only from A1 protein. It's not released from A2 protein. Okay? So digestion is different. Three, BCM7 is a powerful opioid. It can be shown to be an opioid when you inject it in rats. There's animal models. And it's blocked with naloxone, an opioid-blocking drug. Okay? Four, in susceptible rats. When you give rats A1 protein, they get diabetes. When you give those same population of rats A2 protein, they don't get diabetes. When you give those susceptible rats A1 protein with naloxone, they don't get diabetes. That's interesting, because you can block it so you know you're doing something pharmacologically effective along the line of you know this is an opioid. And so when you give something, you block it, and that fixes it. That's, again, another chink. It's not proof, but you're sort of building a wall of, of argument. Okay? Rabbits. Rabbits fed A1, A1 beta casein get considerably more plaque in their arteries than similar rabbits fed A2 protein in just a few weeks. Okay? Another, just a, again, another chink. They're rabbits, they're not humans. Brain diseases, autism and schizophrenic persons excrete a large amount of BCM7, which only comes from A1 casein, and it declines markedly when put on a milk-free diet, in tandem with symptoms improving. The same connection also happens with people who have leaky gut, and when they start getting what might be called leaky gut. And finally, the mechanisms of disease make sense. Autoimmune diabetes, BCM7, looks like a part of the islet cell of the pancreas. In heart disease, the oxidant properties of BCM7 make sense because that helps how, that's how oxid, heart disease gets going. In autism and schizophrenia, the opioid receptor activity has. So all of those have, they're not all the same thing, but they all make sense in context of the disease they're causing. Okay? So one more time, I'd like to beat this to death. What's on the right? A black cow, Wisconsin cow, A1 milk. What's on the left? Holstein. All right. So, 
So early and prolonged exposure to BCM7 in infant formulas may therefore be a significant factor in the rising incidence of autism, Asperger's, type 1 diabetes, heart disease. Research on the presence of BCM7 in infant formula has not been done and is urgently needed. But then there's politics. In the multiple episodes, if you want to read a book about corporate shenanigans, you'll love them. It's like almost leading a, a, a summer murder mystery, reading a book, The Devil in Milk. So I'll go home and buy a copy of it and have fun reading it, because it was like spy versus spy. And it was, they went back and forth and back and forth, and it was in the papers. It's been going on in New Zealand for the last 10 years. And you know what the dairy farmers in New Zealand have done? 100% converted to A2 cows. So in the last 10 years, they followed what's called the precautionary principle. The signs looks a little muddy, but you know, if I can get a choice between A1 sperm and A2 sperm, what am I going to do? I'm going to get A2 sperm. And it'll take me a couple of years. So New Zealand has now completely converted its dairy herd to A2 cows, as has Australia. Last year, the A2 Corporation was the number one stock on the New Zealand Stock Exchange. It went up 500%. They are now gaining traction and taking off like wildfire. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's what it looks like. And there's now a disruptive new grocery chain in the Milwaukee area called? Myers. Myers. And Myers now has A2 milk. As of last month, Myers now has A2 milk. I wrote to Outpost, I've written to every national, uh, natural food store in the area and said, please get it. But Myers does have it. I have now bought in about five gallons of it, so please go buy some for me too. But this was in the paper last week. Anybody see this pay article? The first dairy farmer to go public. In my practice, I have a client who has a dairy herd who says, I'm about a year away. He says, there's at least 20 herds I know of in Wisconsin that are, fr we all know about it. He says, there's about 20 herds that are converting, but nobody wants to talk about it because it's such a big story. <laughs> okay. Anybody here want to have heart disease? Anybody want a child with autism? Anyone have a child with schizophrenia? Hell no. So what are you to do as a responsible, caring parent, adult, aunt, uncle? We need to tell our friends and neighbors about it and start developing that market. Start buying this. It's going to be more expensive for a while, but the market's going to flip. It will not stay with A1 milk. Now, there'll probably still be Holsteins. Holsteins are incredibly productive animals, but I want A2 Holsteins. And right now, they're about 50-50. And you know that bull breeding service by, in Madison, Wisconsin, where they've always got those funny logos by the freeway? I'm sure they know about it. I'm sure there's... They're busily doing a business right now, but it's all behind the scenes. So what do you want for you and you and you and you and you and me? Well, this was in the paper on June 26th, so two, three weeks ago. What city so, the dairy? Uh, oh, I don't know the name of it. East of Athens in Marathon County, Joseph Zager's herd of 40 cows produces a type of milk that should shake up the dairy industry. It's going to shake up the dairy industry. This, I think... So have I convinced you yet that this will be the biggest story in Wisconsin business? Because dairy is our number one product. And so there are, I don't know how many dairy farms there are in Wisconsin, uh, but I think this is going to start making a difference because I will no longer drink A1 milk. I'm switching. So what will work for me? I believe in what we call the precautionary principle. My father got diabetes and heart disease. I have lousy blood sugar. And there's no harm in avoiding A1 milk. And no harm in drinking A2 milk. And I can buy it at Myers. God bless them. And my bottom line, if you're not worried about heart disease, heart, autism, schizophrenia, and then don't, you know, don't use it. Cheese is probably okay because less BCM is released. So for those of you who are cheeseaholics, you can still do that. Oh, and these are some other statistics. So isn't that an interesting story? Yes, Did I convince you? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty profound story. Yeah, questions? Is it? Does the milk matter if it's pasteurized or raw? I don't know. Is, uh, the question was, does it matter if it's pasteurized or raw? I believe that the pasteurization heating process does change the protein some degree. 
But we've been fighting about all sorts of things. This whole raw milk fight is an interesting one, and it may be because we've been getting, looking at it sideways, and this is the real issue, and we've been trying to figure it out because we know there's something wrong with milk, and we've been trying to get away with it, and we haven't seen the picture. And this might help clarify it. This might be the issue that we were kind of looking at and not quite getting the right story. What I do know is that pasteurizing kills most bacteria. Now what this topic wasn't about tonight, I want to tell you another story about milk. Let me just tell you another story. My contribution to healthcare in Wisconsin was about 10 years ago, I called up the head of the lab at Aurora Healthcare and I said, the range of vitamin D as normal from the lab doesn't make sense because at that time the range of normal was 7 to 52. And I said, that doesn't make sense. And I said, because there's a study in the journal Science that shows that if you take your white cells, take your white cells, draw some blood, put your white cells in 15 different Petri dishes, and put tuberculosis in all 15 of those Petri dishes, and then put different levels of vitamin D in there, you can't kill tuberculosis until you get to a level of 32. And precisely at 32, your white cells get turned on, vitamin D makes them mature into mature cells. It's called a toll receptor protein. You can make something called cathelicidin. And he listened to me and he says, that's really interesting. Oh, somebody's taking me seriously. I thought that was cool. And he said, do you know that Crohn's disease is the number one admission to children's hospital? I'd never heard that, and that kind of blew me away, and I thought, huh. And he says, it's increased by about a couple hundred percent in the last 20 years. Okay. Now, there's only three or four diseases that make little things called granulomas. A granuloma is a swirl of white cells that almost looks like a football. And tuberculosis in your lungs, that's how you diagnose it. You see granulomas on the chest x-ray. You do all these thousands of little spots. And you cough up blood and you have tuberculosis in your, okay. But Crohn's disease has granulomas in your gut, okay. Now Crohn's disease has increased in incidence by a huge amount in the last 50 years. He says, have you ever heard of Yoni's disease? This is on the phone call still. And I say, what's Yoni's disease? I say, how do you spell that? And he said, J-O-H-N-E. And I found that extremely offensive because my middle initial is E, and my first name is John, <laughs> and here's somebody naming a disease after me without talking to me. <laughs> so I can remember it at least. So Yoni's disease, I said, what's that? He says, about 1% of the cows of Wisconsin have Yoni's disease, and that's atypical tuberculosis. And it's not cured by pasteurizing. Okay, when you drink a glass of milk, how many cows are getting on that glass of milk? 30,000. Right? Because it's, it's every dairy in eastern Wisconsin is coming to that processing plant and processing it. So it's all being mixed up together in giant tank trucks. You're not getting milk from just one dairy farm. It's, you know, ten trucks all mixed together. And every dairy herd has one cow in it. One percent of the cows of Wisconsin have Yoni's disease. They can't find it. And it's not completely cleared by pasteurizing. So is Yoni's disease, atypical tuberculosis of cows, causing tuberculosis in the gut, and we call that Crohn's disease? Is that an interesting story or what? So I'm not real enthusiastic about drinking a lot of milk, one way or the other, just for that reason. And I personally would love to say I'd like to have a dairy herd where I could just go to and get my milk from one herd, and I'd want them to be real careful about Yoni's disease or whatever, if we could follow that. But I do know that t pasteurizing has taken tuberculosis out of cows. And it was just 100 years ago that, that tuberculosis was the number two cause of death in America. And pasteuriz pasteurizing milk was part of that huge public health victory. We don't realize how utterly dangerous that was and how having raw milk does put you at risk. So I just have concerns on all those topics. But I'm not sure that pasteurizing in our current method, you can't tell me that every molecule of milk is heated up precisely right. There's something that goes through at the beginning, the machine's just warming up, there was some milk left over, whatever. Some gets through the system 
and some Yoni's disease come out and your, your son ends up with Crohn's disease. Is there anybody here who doesn't know somebody with Crohn's disease? We all know somebody. It's incredibly common. And it may be an infectious disease in the gut. I have three patients, four patients in my practice who are on antibiotics for tuberculosis with their Crohn's disease and are in remission currently. That's what I'm doing in my practice. I'm putting them on rifampin and, and low-dose naltrexone. So getting their immune system boosted up and taking them off of milk and putting them and saying, you should be on some antibiotic to sell. And there's about three or four clinical trials starting on that, that uh, to prove it over time, but it's going to take a time to prove it. I make homemade milk kefir. Uh -huh. Does it matter if I use the A1 or A2? I will go get the A2, but I have all, for years now, A1. Is that a problem? I make home, she asked the question, I make homemade kefir. And I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But I'm assuming that fermenting it, Fermented. that the bacteria do the work for you. Thanks. And that's what you want. That's what I thought. think that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, but that's what I would put my, if I had to guess, that's what I would put my guess I'll on. So yo and so the reason this has become an issue in the last hundred years is because prior to this, we just didn't drink fresh milk. We turned everything into cheese and, and yogurts and kefirs or you know, whatever, we had to process milk pretty quickly unless you drank it straight from your cow, which, you know, you didn't, we didn't have a large industrial distribution system that mixed 10,000 cows all into one glass of milk. Okay. So there isn't, I thought that you'd like that extra story just thrown in there just for the sake of that. So any other questions? Yes. So yogurt, yogurt's okay. Uh, yogurt's okay, uh, but not low-fat yogurt. Right. You're, drink, you're eating high-fat yogurt, right? Yeah. Full-fat yogurt. Okay, good. Then you can have that. Yeah, so I get Fahe yogurt or I get Greek God yogurt, full fat yogurt. So, because you know that many of the yogurts with fruit on the bottom, with the sugar added that are low fat, in other words, 90% of the yogurt you see has as much sugar in it as a Coca Cola, as a sugared soda. Yeah, so that's actually causing a lot of trouble. We need to get away from the sugar, it's the real problem, not the fat. Yeah. Yes? Cottage cheese isn't really fermented. It's just precipitated. Mm -hmm. so that would be it may not be successfully fermented. Okay. Yeah. Why, you're fond of cottage cheese, I take it. Well, sometimes yeah. I like it. Yeah. I do love cheese, but I've switched to cheese. I just don't think we know, and I don't think we're ever going to know, and I just think it's time for our, our, us consumers to follow what I call, what he calls the precautionary principle. I just think I want to be careful. Yeah, goat cheese day too. You have all the goat cheese. She was saying that she was doing goat cheese. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Okay. You can have all the goat cheese you want. Okay. Then when you go to Meyers, do they sell like cottage cheese and other things from A2 cups? Not yet, but I bet it's going to show up pretty quickly. How about um, cream for your coffee? Uh, <laughs> there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of casein and whipping, and whipping cream. Heavy whipping cream is mostly fat. Use almond milk creamer. There's not a so lot of, milk. yes? Oh, that's my question, John. From milk to a half and half or heavy whipping cream, you'll have less of the B. The casein in it. Oh, right. Really? Right. Because we use yeah. heavy whipping cream. Heavy whipping cream is basically fat. Yeah, I, I, have, I personally drink, make bulletproof coffee. How many people here know bulletproof coffee, right? Oh, good, about a third of you. The recipe for bulletproof coffee is you brew your favorite cup of coffee, and you put in one big tablespoon of butter, one big tablespoon of whipping cream, and one big tablespoon of coconut oil. Or have you got uh, MCT oil here? No. Okay. Or MCT oil, which is refined coconut oil. That's a 300 calorie drink, but it forces your brain to run on ketones and fat. And so you don't get sleepy and you don't feel like eating for six hours. So you go a long time without eating, or at least you know, a period of time, and it helps you lose weight. So for those folks who would like to lose weight, uh, bulletproof coffee works like a charm. There's a whole bulletproof diet and a bulletproof book that's actually very entertaining. He's a brilliant guy. He sells a coffee. He claims, and I think I believe him, that America is the only advanced industrial nation that does not regulate the amount of mold in coffee. 
We regulate the amount of mold. Remember the peanut factory that went out of business last year because they were cheating and they didn't regulate their mold down in Georgia? We regulate the mold in peanuts very closely. In Wisconsin, every, bale of, every bushel of corn gets dried out at corn dryers, otherwise they're going to get moldy. So we, we regulate and watch the mold in much of our food chain, but coffee we don't watch. And he says, if you are sensitive to the mold in coffee, when you drink coffee, you get sleepy. And that's what happens to me. If I stop at a, a, a gas station and get some cheap coffee from a, you know, a truck stop kind of place, within, a, an, within two exits, I'll be fast. I, I can't stay awake. Uh, whereas if I buy expensive coffee at, at uh, more expensive places, it very rarely makes me sleep. Then it jacks me up, and I'm all perked up. And I'm good for six hours. But we don't regulate it. So the man who did the bulletproof coffee now is selling bulletproof coffee that's guaranteed no mold in it. So it's 14 to $15 a pound, so it's pricey, but it's mold-free. And nobody else makes mold-free coffee in America. And so for those of you, you might have noticed it. I don't know if any of you else you noticed, but it's sure powerful for me. And I get very sleepy when I drink coffee, it's just because I feel even the K-cup coffee. The K-cup coffees have mold in them because sometimes it's hit or miss. So I have, very, I have very eccentric responses to coffee. Sometimes I fall asleep and sometimes it perks me up. Yeah. And I think it's when I read the, his book about mold and coffee, that's what gave me that insight. Yes? So why is it that um, when we have milk and the, and, and the reaction would be a bloated stomach, but you have cheese and there is no reaction? Is that because of the process? That's probably the lactose and the sugars. Many people have lactose deficiency, and lac who, can tell, who can tell me what lactose deficiency is? That's the inability to break that sugar called lactose, which is one glucose and one galactose. You can't cut it in half. You don't have that enzyme. So that double sugar gets all the way down to your colon. The bacteria in your colon do what? They say, thank you very much. And they make a lot of gas and carbon dioxide and acid, and so your stomach bloats. And all that acid irritates your colon, so you blow out your pipes. <laughs> Is that a polite way of saying? Right. Yeah. Right. So that's what's happened. But that's a simple chemical. That's a very simple, very, com you know. So there are folks who have lactose insufficiency who say, I can eat one scoop of ice cream, but I can't do two. You know, because they don't quite get the threshold of making enough of a reaction. They'll get a little bit of bloating, but not enough to be problematic. Yes? Well, that's a question. Ice cream. Ice cream from A1 cows, is that also then would be? Of course. Okay. I mean, and this is what's going to happen. So if there's anybody here who has an extra million to spend, uh, I think this is a business opportunity to make a, to get going on start making cheese and, and, and ice cream and all from A2, A2 cows. Because it's coming. One grocery store chain's got it. I've asked at every grocery chain in town, they, so I've made managers, I've been obnoxious and asked every manager about it. So it's going to start, whether it filters up or not, we'll find out. Yes? Are the A2 cows grass-fed cows or organic? Or that's a whole separate issue. So it's not? Uh, that's another business opportunity. <laughs> Grass-raised A2 cows and we'll all be in heaven. <laughs> in fact, I'm probably going to be in heaven or whatever before that happens. I think A2 is much more important. Right. right. Hmm. I'm here because I'm a grandparent of twin 14 months old, and their pediatrician said, you're, when you're done breastfeeding, just go to whole milk. And they just go and buy whatever's the cheapest. So this, when are pediatricians on board with this? You have to ask the pediatrician. They didn't say A2 milk to them. They didn't know it. They don't know. They don't know it. They haven't heard about well, it. Grandma's going to have to stock their refrigerator right. and my own refrigerator. Right. And I, yeah. right. Okay. Do your That's kids scary. a favor. Right. Yeah. And make sure they're on K2 and a little bit of iodine and vitamin D and all the rest of that, too. Yeah. No, I think until we start buying it, it costs three times as much right now. But go read the paper in the article. And go re you might be able to get it cheaper if you drive up to Marathon County, a bit of a drive. But my, the person who's in my practice is by Elkhart Lake, and he's got a fairly large herd, and he's almost online. So you're going to see, what you're going to see is this story come out over the next couple of years. 
and suddenly there's going to become more and more available and as it becomes available those dairy farmers are going to start advertising it and talking about it and you're going to have the satisfaction of understanding it because I showed you brown cows versus black cows ten times so there's no excuse not to understand that. <laughs> okay. Yes. So there are no infant formulas that are... Not yet. Made. Nope. Right. We that's bypassed that. We, she went from breast yeah. milk to... And breast milk is wonderful. There's no such, there's no better thing than breast milk for as long as you yeah. can do it. But in America, we have people who have to work, and, and so it's a little hard. Not every place allows you to hide out, sneak off and pump, and, you know, so it's hard to do all that. I have a son getting married next year, and, I'm, and she's quite an ardent uh, advocate for breastfeeding, and I'm thinking, oh, good luck. She works for Gillette, and she flies all over Europe. And I say, I don't know how you're going to do this, but go for it. <laughs> you know, yes? What's that? Butter. Butter is mostly fat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at all the comments about K2, you know, for food. Um, and if you eat grass-fed cows, you, will you get enough um, K2, do you think? Or do we need supplements? I don't, different subjects. I'm just curious. I don't think we know. Uh, that's where K2 comes from, yeah. you know. Uh, what I know is things like if you guy, I've seen the numbers of grass-raised cows, uh, so, I'm sorry, Dutch Gouda cheese versus American Gouda cheese. Made the same way, tastes the same, both are called Gouda, but the Dutch are very proud of their cows eating grass because they have the best environment in the world for making grass. They get drizzle 365 days of the year. And in America, we feed them corn and beans. So the Dutch have about four to five times the amount of K2 in their, in their cheese. Where, and because as soon as we take our cows off, then they don't get it. And I probably have had 50 women in my practice now who have come back to me and have had two bone density tests after taking K2 for a year, and whose bone density almost universally goes up. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Why did you mention iodine? 